Good evening. Welcome back to Chartwell Booksellers. Uh, we are back. In fact, we've never gone anywhere, I'm happy to say, since the last time we saw you. Uh, our announced move here within the Park Avenue Plaza Arcade was uh, ultimately rescinded, at least for now. So I welcome you back to Chartwell Booksellers. Uh, my name is Barry Singer, and I am the proprietor. In all of our 33 years of existence, we have never celebrated Clementine Churchill's birthday, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it falls on April 1, and we are celebrating it early tonight with Sonia Purnell. Happy birthday, Clementine. Sonia Purnell uh, is a very accomplished journalist uh, who be began her career at The Economist and has written for most of the major newspapers left in England, it would appear, including the Daily Telegraph, Daily Mail, Independent on Sunday, and the London Evening Standard. It was during her time writing the for The Telegraph in the early 1990s that Sonia first met and worked with Boris Johnson, uh, today the mayor of London and an old friend of ours here, uh, two years ago or so, he was here to speak about uh, his book about Winston Churchill, The Churchill Factor, uh, and we had a wonderful time with him. Uh, he became the subject of Sonia's celebrated first book, Just Boris. Sonia has now turned her attention to Clementine Churchill with a book that we are, are all very grateful for. Uh, it is quite an extraordinary achievement uh, in the field of Churchill scholarship and uh, as a way of reviving um, attention uh, on Clementine that uh, she's most deserving of. I look forward to everything that Sonia has to say on this subject. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sonia Purnell. Thank you very much, Barry. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it's lovely to be in this fine bookshop with all these books about Winston Churchill, dozens, hundreds, possibly, thousands and I'm particularly pleased now to see that there's a book so prominent about Clementine because I, I do feel that she has been rather overlooked and I was struck when I was researching I spent you know a long time researching my book and I was struck <clears throat> when I was reading all the books about Winston how many of them actually skirted over Clementine barely mentioned her some of them didn't mention her at all and yet after years of looking into everything she did, reading diaries and letters and personal accounts, meeting people who knew her, I discovered that she was very, very important indeed, not just to Churchill himself, but to all of us, to, to, to the world and to world peace. And sure, there has been one other book about Clementine by Mary Soames, of course, her daughter, but that came out nearly 40 years ago now and was a wonderful book, but also conspicuous in, in some of the gaps it left. All of us, I think, as sons and daughters would perhaps leave things out about our parents if we were writing about them. But also, time gives you a fresh perspective. We look at things differently now to the way that we looked at them 40 years ago. More has more materials come to light. More people have come out to, to, to talk about um, Clementine. So as I say, the more I looked into her, the more I realised that this woman was not only important to Winston, she was important to all of us. She's one of the most significant, the most important forgotten figures of history. And on several occasions, having nothing better to do, I've, I've asked just a straw poll of people, I've picked up a picture of her on her own without Winston, and I've said, do you know who this woman is? People of many ages, different nationalities, and um, I'm up to about 21 people now that I've asked this. Only one got close. And, but uh, she thought um, that this one might be Churchill's mother. She didn't guess it was Churchill's wife, but she realised that there was something Churchillian about her, and as indeed there, were, there was very much. So when I pulled together these archives, I realised that there was a great deal out there that had simply been lost, forgotten about, ignored. I found tapes that had been made by um, <clears throat> interpreters when she went to see Stalin in the Kremlin on her own on, in 1945, an extraordinary event in itself. She had a wonderful interpreter called Hugh Lungi, now no longer with us, sadly, but um, someone had the foresight to tape an interview with him some time before he died about this extraordinary event. And that interview was taped and then ignored. Um, no one had ever actually bothered to listen to it. And yet there it was, a description of this wonderful 
wonderful, that's not the right word, this extraordinary historic meeting with Stalin on her own in Stalin's study at the Kremlin with just Molotov and Hugh Lungi for company. Well, I don't think many people have a, a story like that to tell, but that story had disappeared into history until I managed to find Hugh Lungi's tape. But that wasn't the only one. There were so many letters and diaries and events, little papers all over the place that had been lost, left on a trolley in a back room somewhere, not opened. Um, I, I found one, another another tape that had been closed, been made secret by the British government for 30 years. And this was the account by her former secretary, Grace Hamlin, Clementine's former secretary, Grace Hamlin, as to how that famous Graham Sutherland painting had been destroyed. Of course, we all knew it had been destroyed. We all thought that Clementine had something to do with it. We never knew the exact circumstances. And this tape, it had been closed for years and then been left and ignored, was of um, an interview with, with Grace Hamlin that, admitting that she had done it, that Clementine had said to her, please help me to destroy this painting. And so she asked her brother, who was um, a landscape gardener, you need to help me destroy the painting. We've got to do something for it for Lady C. And um, he brought his van round to Chartwell in the dead of night. It was a big painting. They both lifted it up, struggled, I think, put it in the van, drove to his house, which was some miles away, and took it round the house into the backyard, away from any potential prying eyes, and burnt it. So that's how that painting disappeared. And, but that's how I found out. And it's extraordinary that so much is out there. But often these archives um, filed under the name Clementine Churchill rather than Winston Churchill have been ignored. And so together with all of this information and together with talking to people who are still alive, five or six of her PAs are still around, still very keen to talk. Most of them have never been approached by authors before. But as you probably know, a lot of staff who work for the Churchill family were made almost like members of the family, lived with them pretty much day and night, saw what life was like as a Churchill and what life was like as Clementine Churchill very clearly. And they were able to give me a very personal account of what she was like. What was it like to be in a room with her? What was she like when she laughed? What was she like when she was in a rage, which did happen from time to time, as we know? What was she like when she was sad? And what exactly did she manage to, to give to Churchill? So I think it, it isn't the question as to um, just what, what did she do for Churchill, but actually what could Winston Churchill have done without her? It's, it's interesting that I got this picture that she was very important from everything that I read and the people I spoke to, but those who were actually there at the time understood the how significant she was. And I draw your attention to Pug Ismay, General Hastings Ismay, Churchill's chief of staff, obviously, during the Second World War. Not exactly a feminist, I think it's fair to say, but he was there watching them both at work, trying to win that desperate struggle, trying to save their country and, and ultimately the world. And he came to one conclusion, and his conclusion was that without Clementine, the history of Winston Churchill, yes, but also the history of the world would have been very different. And so I found it extraordinary that her story had never been told. It, it seemed beholden to me to try and do something about that. And then I read a book by um, <clears throat> Gil Wynant, who was the American ambassador to Britain, as I'm sure you know, during the war, a, a book he wrote before his tragic death in 1947. And, and in this book, A Letter from Grosvenor Square, he wrote that he hoped one day, if the future breeds historians of understanding, that someone would write the story of Clementine Churchill and exactly what she'd done and the contribution she'd made to the world. OK, so I think you're asking at this point, so what did she do? What made her so important, apart from being married to Winston Churchill for 57 years, which, believe me, was not easy, um, and I think she deserves some tribute just for sticking with it. But she wasn't just a wife, she was his partner, she was his political partner, she was his greatest advisor, his greatest influence. She vetted those speeches, those famous speeches. They were sent to her to edit, to change, sometimes to take things out, sometimes to add. They were rehearsed with her, and after he'd given them, he would turn to her and say, was that all right? He waited for her approval. She didn't just get involved in the speeches. 
She also spoke to members of the cabinet. Sometimes she would order them around. If they fell out, she would try and um, broker peace deals. She knew all the secrets during the war, even the Bletchley Park decrets. Most of the cabinet didn't know about those. The Churchills called them the golden eggs. She knew about them. She knew about the absolute tortured decisions sometimes that Churchill had to make when he knew that an attack was going to happen, but he couldn't do anything about it because then that would make the enemy realise that, that we were able to decrypt the Enigma code. That couldn't happen. Terrible, terrible, intolerable decisions had to be made sometimes as a result. She took them with him. She helped to share the burden. The night before D-Day, he was haunted, haunted by the memory of the Dardanelles back in the First World War when he had sent so many men to their deaths. Only one person could understand this. Only one person could try to share that burden. And Clementine and, and Winston dined together alone the night before D-Day when he was deeply, deeply troubled about what was going to happen the following morning. Would it be a success? Would it be another catastrophic failure? Would there be thousands and thousands of young lives lost for, for nothing? It was a terrible burden and, and she was always there to support him. But she also had her own projects. The air raid shelters in London, the Blitz, night after night after night, people stuck in these awful places, in tube stations, in underground, dark, wet, cold, frightening, no lavatories, no fire exits, beds so narrow and uncomfortable parents couldn't sleep alongside their frightened children. This would not do. She realised that Britain had, all it had really was morale and the feeling of being in it together and so she took it upon herself she wasn't an elected she wasn't a politician she wasn't even a civil servant but she directed an incredible program to improve those air raid shelters so lighting was put in Dis the bedding was disinfected to stop um, disease spreading which was a real problem she ordered Lord Beaverbrook, of all people once her sworn enemy hardly an easy person to order around but she told him in no uncertain terms that he would be responsible for the production of two million new beds, specifically wide enough for a mother to sleep alongside her child during a raid so that she could comfort that child. She knew these things were important. And he did what he was told, by the way. Those two million beds were manufactured. That was down to Clementine. Not many people would take Lord Beaverbrook on and win. She didn't just take on the members of the cabinet or other ministers. She was also extraordinarily brave with world leaders. She'd been a fearful, tearful child, but she stood up to FDR. Everyone else, might, by and large, fell for his charms. Clearly, extremely charming man. She sometimes would take him on when she thought he wasn't being straight with Winston. She often told Winston to be careful with FDR, to be slightly more wary, to be less emotionally transparent, all the while, while of course keeping that vital Anglo-American alliance going. General de Gaulle, one of the most prickly people you can imagine, often used to prompt great outbursts from Churchill, who really resented the way that he wasn't sufficiently grateful sometimes for all that was being done for France. And she knew that if they fell out again, this would be disastrous. And she knew how difficult de Gaulle and Churchill could be. So she would quite often lecture Churchill, now don't unnecessarily rile de Gaulle. And when de Gaulle was arriving, on at least one occasion, she would say, this way, General, and she would take him off into the garden or somewhere where she could talk privately. And she would say something along the lines of, Mon General, you must be careful not to hate your allies more than your enemies. And the general took this in good heart, actually. And, and that day, there was a particular day that she said that particular line, he even agreed to speak English over lunch and during his meeting with Churchill, which was most unusual. But he respected her, he respected what she had to say, and during and after the war, they became great friends. In fact, on the first anniversary of Churchill's death, in 1966, she received one letter. That one letter was a handwritten, very warm, personal letter from General de Gaulle, now President of France. So that friendship lasted for a long time, unlikely though it was. Stalin, as I've already said, <clears throat> she went and saw him 
in the Kremlin on her own at a time of particularly icy Anglo-Soviet relations. Extraordinary. She, would, she took him on. She knew that Russia had to be kept on side. Her, her men, her military might was so necessary to finish the war, but she was also not afraid to raise the appalling news of um, the atrocities that were committed by Russians in Poland. In fact, in some ways, she was more hawkish on that than Churchill himself. So she was a power broker. She was an ambassador extraordinaire. She vetted those speeches. She counselled him on his conferences with Stalin and Roosevelt. She was dealing with the cabinet. When Churchill was away, she was almost like a deputy prime minister. She would keep him informed of what was going on at home. She would keep the cabinet in order as much as she could. And she would um, be looking at any sort of political issues that might be coming up that needed to be dealt with. She was a, a woman of many, many parts. And you consider how extraordinary that was. Britain doesn't have a first lady. There is no office. There are no staff. There is no rule book. She was a woman born into the Victorian age. She couldn't vote until she was well into her 30s. And yet she managed to have a role during a war that was extraordinary in its importance and breadth of scope. And there's really no one has ever matched it subsequently. She invented that role from scratch. Of course, it wasn't just about the public political sphere that she was dealing with. She also kept Churchill alive. He was in his mid to late 60s. He drank, he smoked cigars, he took no exercise whatsoever. And he had no, no downtime, as we would call it now. He conducted a war for five long years. He kept a country going that really should have fallen. He gave the Brits self-belief when they had nothing else. It was an intolerable burden. It would have killed practically anyone. The burden was huge, and yet she managed to keep him going. She looked after him. She cheered him up when he was down. She foresaw his needs. She knew he liked good food, particularly important food. She made sure that even in wartime, all that rationing, that what was offered on the Churchill table was of the highest quality. She didn't cook it herself, of course, but she made sure that Mrs Landemar was on on um, site and ready to, to prepare the most wonderful meals, and that kept morale going. So she was important in every sphere of Churchill's life. And indeed, she was very important in bringing America into the war. She saw, like he did, that America was... Britain's only saviour long term it couldn't possibly continue on its own and she sacrificed everything to bring America into the war including her relationship with her son she presided over encouraged Pamela then married to Randolph um, and her various amorous adventures with influential Americans she made that possible some people find that very shocking in the current day looking back at at that, perhaps it is shocking, but she understood how necessary it was to save her country and she would do anything for her husband and his huge drive and desire to win the war. So I, I think we have an enormous amount to thank Clementine for. And she has disappeared into the midst of history. No one really knows much about her anymore. And I think that's a great sadness and it's also actually doesn't give us an accurate portrayal of history and of what life was like for Churchill and where he got his emotional sustenance from. After all, it was Stalin who said he could think of no other instance in history where the future of the world depended on the courage of one man. And I think that's a very fair assessment. But where did that one man get his courage and his resolve from? Another source. Let's go to Lord Moran, Churchill's personal physician, who said that he observed that Churchill drew his resolve from Clementine. So yes, Churchill carried us as a nation, carried us you know, globally, but she carried him as a man, and she was incredibly important for that reason. And I think at this point we should perhaps consult the sort of ultimate source on this subject and find out what Churchill himself thought. And even though in his six-volume 
um, account of the Second World War. If you take volume two, for instance, she appears in the index only once as Churchill misses. So perhaps to the world, he didn't quite admit just how important she was. But to her, he did. And on the uh, 40th anniversary of their wedding, so this is September 1948, they were on holiday in the south of France, and they always had separate bedrooms. She had to have somewhere to retreat from this incredible, huge personality that was always her domain, and he always had to seek permission to enter her bedroom all through their marriage, ever since they got back from their honeymoon. Anyway, that morning, um, he put a little note under her door, um, and he, th he thanked her for all the happiness she'd given him in what he described as a world of accident and storm. But he also said that how she had made his life and all the work that she had done, all the work that he had done in his life possible. So he knew just how important she had been. And I suppose I wrote the book to try and explain to an audience today, so few people do know about her, just how much we owe her, just as he owed her so much, and how her story was one of being a, a very timid child, one who was terrified of the man she thought was her father, but wasn't her father. She had a rather rackety, aristocratic background, rather impoverished and constantly moving house to escape her creditors and so on. But she transformed herself from that fearful child into a woman who was afraid of, of no one, no world leader, no situation. And that story, the more I found out about it, the more incredible it was. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to see the book here today, see how she's finally going to be given some of the credit she deserves, and I very much encourage you all to find out more about her. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take questions if we have them. I mm -hmm. have one for you. Does anyone else have a question before I ask one? Oh, good. Oh, I should have done Go ahead. Sir. Did you ask? No. Um, oh, yeah, you, you have to go. Yeah. Please. Mm. Could you speak a bit about uh, any of the obstacles you encountered during the time you were writing the book? Did you or did you sort of run dry from time to time, or did you sort of hit walls? Because, as you said, in his own uh, autobiography, she's mentioned so rarely, once, I guess. Mm. So what difficulties did you encounter in researching and trying to go deeper than just a single mention? Well, actually, I, I, th I was incredibly lucky in the sense I the, the first place you look are the letters so um, you know you can see her writing how she spoke how they interacted so that was the first place to look and I tell you <clears throat> what really sparked my interest was the letter she sent to him in 1940 not long after he became prime minister and if you think about the background to this where Britain was expected to fall any day France was falling the, the Benelux countries had already gone. He was Prime Minister. The, the strain couldn't have been greater. But someone goes to see her, because they always realised that she was like an ultimate authority over him, that you could always go to Clementine. And someone said to her, you know, the Prime Minister's being rough and overbearing with his staff and they're frightened of him and it's not a good thing to war. And so um, she wrote him a letter. She ripped up the first draft and then she wrote another one. And she said, you know, you need to make sure your staff love you, not not fear you. In wartime, it's more important than ever. And you, you need to stop being this way and, and start being your old self. And, and then I tried to find a reply, and there was no reply. So then I cast the net further, and I looked at all the diaries of his entourage, all those private secretaries, those cabinet secretaries, all the rest of it, and I realised that the answers were there, because then I looked at Jock Colville, for instance, and he said the Prime Minister's bad-tempered phase was a passing one, not long after this letter. And you know, many of the other ones, many of the other diaries backed this up. Yes, he still barked at people when he was angry or frustrated, of course. But then another private secretary said, after the prime minister barked at whoever it was, he realised that he'd upset the man. So he put his arm round him and said, I don't mean to be fierce. I only mean to be fierce with one man, and, and that's Hitler. So it was joining the dots. It was trying to sort of look at the dates, look at things that, changed as a result of her interventions and it became quite clear the pattern was very very clear 
And then the other thing that I was very lucky with was the um, Pamela Harriman files at the Library of Congress in Washington, not yet formatted on one of these dusty trolleys at the back of beyond some rather nice professorial types. Oh, yes, OK, we'll let you have a look at them. But lots of really great information there. She was with them a lot during the war. And then finding some of the PAs who were still alive and being able to talk to them. So actually, from starting at the point where I was worried about not getting enough information, it became addictive because I realised that there was so much out there. I mean, like these tapes that no one had listened to before. And so, in fact, it was too much material rather than too little. But then a biographer is very happy when that happens. So, yeah. Thank you. Question I was, I've, I've never been able to understand quite clearly how the war in Europe ended with Clementine not at Churchill's side, but at Stalin's side <laughs> in Russia. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is a bit... What was that all about? <laughs> well, um... She, she was invited by Stalin to go over to Russia. She'd raised the equivalent of about $500 million in today's money for the Aid to Russia Fund, um, which she had organised and orchestrated, and it was all part of this idea of keeping, keeping the Soviets on side for as long as possible. And also there was a lot of discontent in Britain. that A lot of people felt that Britain wasn't doing enough to help Russia, but Britain simply didn't have the men or the money or the materials to do it. So she was trying to solve two problems at once with this. Stalin, no friend of Churchill, clearly, was actually genuinely impressed, I think, at what she did. Invited her over in April 1945. Well, no one knew for sure that the war was going to end the, the following month. But when, <clears throat> once she was there, she realised how useful it was for her to be on the ground. She was able to send back some very, very useful information to Churchill back in London. She also wanted to tackle Stalin on what was going on in Poland, no doubt about it. So she didn't want to leave. She had that one meeting. She had been promised a second meeting, which never materialised, but she wanted to hang around to um, see whether she could have that second meeting. She was being given an honour by Stalin. She didn't want to miss that. She was also given the chance to interrogate Tito. Churchill wanted to find out what's Tito up to, uh, whether he had designs on Trieste. And she invited, there's a great story in the book, she invited um, Tito to where she was staying for an English vicarage tea and she instructed her, her Russian staff to make those cucumber sandwiches without the crust and things. Um, and uh, But there must have been something lost in translation because when Tito arrived... Um, two trolleys were brought into the room, both completely laden down with vodka. So um, the, any idea of uh, the English vicarage tea was, was forgotten and she had to do her interrogation um, over glasses of vodka instead. But she, she did it. But I think that was why she didn't feel that she could rush back because she had such a job of work to do there. I think she was very sad about it and sent him this telegram saying, you know, my darling... I wish I were with you, and what a wonderful day. But she felt that she shouldn't just, you know, jump in a plane and come back, that she was useful there and sending back useful information. And Churchill felt that way too? I, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Do you think mm -hmm. the marriage was ever in jeopardy at all over that long period? Yeah, yeah. I do. The I think in the 30s. It was in quite serious trouble and in those wilderness years. Uh, I think Churchill in power was one person, Churchill out of power was another. I think he was very, very difficult and made her life very difficult. And, I mean, their children, you know, there were so many sort of rows that, with the children as well, the money problems, his extravagance, um, calling on the wrong side of the abdication crisis, all of these things added up to great deal of tension, her own ill health. And I, I think she did ponder on, on divorce, but I think also she knew ultimately where her place lay. And I think as the 30s went on and the threat from Hitler became more and more obvious, I think it was just simply that she knew that her, her future, her destiny, was really to be by Churchill's side and fight that fight, which is what happened. Yeah, we are very lucky she did. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I should oh. come up to be on camera yes. to say I think there's, what, there's oh, maybe there another one, question. Yeah. Even Hi. better, please. Okay. okay. Sorry. I was just going to, um, as you mentioned, Clementine be, 
warning Churchill to be wary of Roosevelt, but I wanted to know if you would comment on her relationship with Eleanor and what that really... Well, um... Well, I, I think that's a really interesting um, relationship and, again, had never been explored. I and mean, I was very lucky to meet some of the members of the Roosevelt family when I was researching the book. And they said, well, yeah, well, no one's ever looked at this before. Fantastic. We want to know about it. And so I went into the library up in Hyde Park and looked at some of their letters there and, and looked at some of the photographs and um, you know some of Eleanor Roosevelt's diaries, especially of her trip to London. And I realised that those two women, although they, they seem very different initially had so much in common not least being married to the men tasked with saving the world and and they came together and did things together when the cracks appeared as they did in, in the relationship between FDR and Churchill and I think they tried to make up for any sort of fault lines there um, and they became friends as well they realized what both of them were going through and had gone through and and that friendship lasted after the war, right up until Eleanor Roosevelt's death, and they they went on meeting. In fact, in the book, there's this wonderful picture of them as quite old ladies, um, and they look like they're having a really good gossip, and it's absolutely <coughs> fabulous. And I, I think there was there was that sort of wonderful rapport between them. I think they probably felt only the other one could really understand what it was like to be them. Yeah. Sonia, she sounds like very much an unofficial Secretary of State in terms of her brilliance as a wife, as a political wife of her time. Do you think she ever had political ambitions beyond her her role as Winston's partner? Um, I think had she been born in a different time, maybe now, um, you know, she, she would certainly be in politics um, off her own back and, you know, perhaps, who knows, she might have become a Prime Minister. Um, she knew that the age that she lived in made that impossible. I mean, she once said, oh, if only I'd been born with trousers, pants, rather than petticoats, who knows, you know, I would have, would have been, like to have been a statesman myself. And sometimes she would give advice to Churchill. She'd, she'd start her little note to him saying, if I were doing it. And then finally, um, Harold Wilson, a Labour Prime Minister, made her a baroness in her own right, so a member of the House of Lords, so part of the legislature. But he chose to wait until Churchill died, so she didn't become a baroness until she was 80. And she was incredibly excited. Finally, she was going to go into Parliament because she was her, not because she was... Mrs. Churchill or Lady Churchill, and the tragedy of it was, and she intended to get really involved, and she did get involved in the campaign to abolish capital punishment in Britain. But apart from that, she realised that her hearing had gone too much for her to follow and participate in the debate. It was too late. She was 80. And I think it's, it is a tragedy that no one did that before that or it wasn't you know in some way wasn't found for her to enter politics properly it's a shame yeah what do you think she would make of the current political landscape in terms of the partners um i'm thinking of particularly mrs trump well i think <laughs> i think she'd be more excited about what mrs clinton is doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think um i like to think that if she was looking down on on what was going on she'd be um thinking, well, you know, America might be about to have its first president and how, a woman president, how interesting that is. And I think also she might be a little disappointed at Mrs. Trump's lack of involvement, shall we say, that um, although she understood that style, personal style, was very important in politics, she wore these turbans as a way of complimenting women who were working in the munitions factory to had to wear them. So she wore them every day as her kind of compliment, her tribute to them. So she understood that style was important, but she also thought there had to be substance, you had to say things, you had to do things. I think she might find some of the situation we have now a bit regressive and a bit disappointing. Indeed. Were her contemporaries, uh, aside from the intimate circle, aware of her importance? I mean, you were able to piece all this together through letters, but one has the impression that very few people were aware of what she was doing and how important she was. I think that's true, but also what's really interesting is that American visitors were particularly 
observant of this. I mean, I, I looked at Henry Morgenthau's diaries, for example, who was um, Roosevelt's um, Treasury Secretary, and he writes quite a lot um, about what he sees Clementine doing. So, you know, we've got Gil Wynant, we've got Avril Harriman, we've got Henry Morgenthau, we've got Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins, after his first um, trip to Britain, spends um, several weeks over there and writes at the end that he's met hundreds, thousands of fascinating, interesting, remarkable people. He was bowed down by that blitz spirit that you hear about so much. But of all of those thousands of people, including Churchill himself, the most fascinating, the most charming, the most wonderful was Mrs. Churchill. So it's interesting. And Henry Morgenthau, she took him round those air raid shelters. Um, no minister could do it, because but this is towards the end of the war when a lot of ministers and Churchill himself were very unpopular and they, they didn't want them to be a little bit of a, you know, an incident where there might be boos or jeers or something. So oh, well, let's get Mrs Churchill to take him round because everyone loves her. And sure enough, they went round these these, um, uh, these air raid shelters, but everyone did love her. She talked to everyone. She was great with everyone. And he wrote in his diary, the dame is unbelievable. She's just like Mrs Roosevelt. So we know from all these sort of different sources that never really been looked at before just the effect that she had on people, and she, people thought she was remarkable. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. We would like to serve you all a glass of Paul Roger champagne in honor of Clementine's birthday and in honor of Sonia's presence here today. And thank you all for coming. And thank you all for watching. And do buy the book and read it. It is a terrific book. Thank you.